Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Libraries in Response, our uh, ongoing session of uh, of uh, of Zooms to discuss uh, libraries dealing with various kinds of uh, crises, starting with the pandemic, but also so then. Uh, an array in 2020 it was just a cascade of social, economic, political, and of course the big Kahuna here uh, crisis uh, is uh, uh, climate change and the extreme weather events that are happening everywhere on the planet. We were just not ready for. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that. So we're the Gigabit Libraries Network, uh, uh, open collaboration of libraries doing interesting things with technology. We're hosted by the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. At the controls in The Hague is uh, our colleague Stephen Weiber, the head of uh, public policy. Uh, our series sponsor is the Internet Society, which I have not corrected the actual link. I did, but I lost it there, Dan. I'm so sorry about that. It's isoc.org, plus there's another one. I'll, I'll get that in the chat corrected. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Our media sponsor is Broadband Breakfast. Uh, our speakers today are Bill McKibben, Everyone should know about Bill, and uh, if you don't, you'll have a chance to today. Uh, Rebecca Smith Aldrich uh, with the uh, uh, advisory, the advisory board committee, president of the Sustainable Libraries Initiative, uh, and then Beth Filar Williams, OSU Libraries, and will talk to us about Insulib, uh, the uh, IFLA affiliate, uh, talking about sustainability. Uh, this is our Broadband from Space series uh, that has delved into different aspects of this technology, which is just a completely new uh, infrastructure. This is a global wireless infrastructure. One single thing uh, with connection, of course, to the Internet backbone. It's all just satellites. And uh, that's remarkable when you consider what it takes to deliver Internet to places on the earth via uh, wires and, and uh, wireless towers. So it creates opportunities for the people who have not been served, some 3 billion people around the world. And the answer that we've given to that, at least the partial response we've given to that, is that you can go to a library and if they're connected, then you can participate. It may not be everything you want, but it is definitely something, unless you get well, you get help. These are the these are the three barriers to adoption that we've sort of articulated and identified that we think are important. That that there's availability. If it's not available, it doesn't matter how much it costs or anything else. But now this will actually deliver it almost anywhere. Uh, so then it gets to well, is it affordable? Okay. Well, uh, libraries acquiring the services like they do with other kinds of resources acquire uh, and share. So then providing free or no fee, low fee uh, access to the internet is a partial response to the affordability. And then usability is a third barrier. Well, why? Which should I care about it? How do I use it? Uh, the various questions that are relevant to its use is another service or function of libraries to, uh, to provide. So just those two things together, uh, a satellite constellation and a physical location that's a library that's staffed and, and has devices and and space and, and personnel can connect anybody. And we think everybody should have that. Every community should be connected. Um, more to the topic today, or actually that's on the topic because of the fact that, that uh, these satellites are immune to terrestrial outages. So... Uh, we can have any of these kind of events that are pictured here and lose your connectivity. But if you have a satellite connection, you're still live. It happened to one of our sites in Montana, which is there were just a handful of sites that we've been able to do in the U.S. There was a line cut on a fiber link that go, went to the town, the region, and everybody was out, including AT&T and Verizon. So nobody had connectivity except the library. And everybody came to the library and connected to the Internet. It wasn't a disaster per se, but it was an outage and a demonstration of the uh, resilience uh, of, of this kind of a strategy. So increasingly, this is going to be important. So the the notion of libraries as responders is kind of the, 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 the underpinning here. 
There are first responders, of course, the police, the fire, and, and uh, medical, and so forth. Uh, but then on a large scale event, these services are typically just overwhelmed. And then it's then what? And what's the communication capability in that kind of an event? Well, libraries are what we would consider second responders, like schools, also clinics, and so forth. And they should have a special communication strategy. It's our is our main point. And because it's getting serious and it's going to get more serious as these events get more uh, intense and more frequent. Uh, the, the, the key point that we want to kind of make here is the distinction between mitigation and adaptation. It's a nice graphic from, from uh, Canada. And a lot of attention has been uh, devoted to mitigation. How can we stop putting more carbon in the atmosphere? How can we get the carbon out of the atmosphere? Well, that's all great and that's all necessary, but it's already too late to stop these effects which are already getting severe and will increase. If we stop today, these events would continue to increase in severity and frequency. So adaptation is something we can do at the local level. Mitigation, we can do our part, but it's going to take large actors taking very large steps to really slow down this accumulation, much less reverse it. But at the adaptation level, we need to deal with what's happening to us at the household level, at the community level. And this is where libraries have a, have a unique role to play. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So uh, this is a quote that we got from uh, Bill McKibben, who will join us shortly. And uh, we'll talk about this concept of uh, the, the, the library as a community hub, a resilient hub, that in places where you have less service, you know, where the 3 billion people live, they're not connected. Those places also tend to be places that are more vulnerable to uh, disasters. They have less resources to cope with it. And so having a, a, a capability like this in those locations would increase their uh, response adaptation capability substantially. At least that's the point he's making. Uh, and we certainly agree with that. And it's it's one reason to do that, to deploy these, to ex, I mean, to determine that they actually work in all your uh, locations, which they seem to so far, to uh, validate that point and then to uh, deploy these as as you can. So let's get to our speakers. And uh, first up, we have uh, Rebecca. Uh, and thank you, Rebecca, for being here today. And I will stop share and turn it over to you. All right, thanks so much, Don, and, and thanks for having me here today. It's nice to be on the screen with Beth again. Beth and I met many years ago on our service through the American Library Association Sustainability Roundtable. So it's cool to see where our paths have taken us and here we are again together. Um, but my day job is as a public library consortia director. I work with 66 public libraries every day. And I've had the pleasure for the past almost decade of working on something called the Sustainable Libraries Initiative to help libraries activate around the urgency for climate change mitigation and adaptation and translate that into the world of libraries. And so when Don asked me to speak about this, I was excited because this is exactly what we've been working on. We've got lots of examples from libraries around the country. Uh, so I'm going to share some of those here today, but I just wanted to kind of tell you a little story about my kind of aha moment it was back in 2014 when the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report came out that was that real bell ringer that said, yeah, like we've got to save the earth, but we better start thinking about saving ourselves too, uh, really kind of noting we turned a corner and it was no longer about rolling back climate change. We also had to adapt in the face of the uh, impacts that were already here, already happening and worsening at a pace that was outpacing projections. So when I read that report, kind of a light bulb went off because a lot of what they were talking about, we could translate into libraries. And so in my first book in 2018, that's a lot of what I talked about was in this report, the things they were calling for at a societal level are things libraries are perfectly positioned to be helping with. So when we think about what libraries are so good at, we're in every town, 
on every campus and every school across the land. So for libraries to step up and own some of this work is really a smart way to catalyze folks around these issues. So thinking about what we're very good at, focusing on local, helping people work together, recognizing and valuing diversity and helping all be heard, not only through our collections, but our programs and catalyzing conversations in our community. So this really fed into our development of this whole idea of what is a sustainable library. A sustainable library is one that is living their values out loud. Excuse me, using that triple bottom line mentality of balancing economic uh, feasibility with social equity and environmental stewardship, but also owning the role of catalyzing social cohesion and civic participation, because that is the keystone actually to adaptation is making sure people will work together to problem solve in the face of whatever's happening in your geography, thanks to climate change. <laughs> and we also want to see libraries taking a deliberate approach and actually purposely setting goals for climate change mitigation, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also simultaneously stepping into the role to help with climate adaptation and building community resilience. So as we think about what that looks like, and I just wanna acknowledge that the next slide I'm gonna show you has way too much text on it. I'm happy to send it to you so you have it as a reference point, but there's both acute and long-term things to focus on for both the library and the community. So the library is gonna to have to make sure itself is resilient in the face of what is happening and what is to come. So, and, and I know you heard from Michelle Stricker from the New Jersey State Library. Shout out to Michelle. I see her in the audience here today. That's the kind of work Michelle's been doing for years is helping libraries get ready. And that includes helping our library workers get ready, making sure they're ready at home so they're able to come and help out at the library so we can help the community. And so this is some thinking that needs to accelerate in libraries. Uh, we just finished a national research study on how well prepared libraries are for some of this work, which will release the results of later this year. But there's obviously work to do in the library community. So you can see very quickly in that acute nature of what we have to work on is getting ourselves ready as institutions so we can be there when our communities need us, as well as helping our communities be ready uh, in the face of what is happening and what needs to happen in the future. So, you know, preparedness training, not only internally, but also for the community, making sure we're connected with emerging emergency management, participating in community emergency response teams. But we've got strategic thinking to do here too. And we've got to keep an eye on the long term. Are we building and renovating facilities that can maintain services so you can have that internet connectivity and the assistance to help people fill out a form from FEMA? Uh, are we going to actually have spaces where people can gather that are free from the air pollution from wildfires? Are we going to have buildings that are resistant to flooding that is happening way more frequently? So that long-term thinking about facilities and shoring them up to make sure they're actually accessible in these critical moments is very important. And then Michelle always talks about the idea of the emergency information hub and how critical that is. But the community needs programming, access to conversations and collections that help them understand the wider world around them. So when we think about long-term investment in community adaptation, we're talking about education, eco-literacy, a lot of work to help people come together and have more respect and empathy and understanding for each other, and also engaging them civically. So they are participating in democracy and helping make decisions that shape policies that will shape the future uh, survivability of the places that we live. And I have to give a shout out, unfortunately, to the whole climate refugee issue that is emerging, both in terms of people that are fleeing areas that are flooding or being hit over and over again by severe storms, and the impact that will have on communities that are closer to the areas that are more stable in a weather uh, respect. So all of this is overseen by the idea of climate justice, right? Uh, we talk often about, well, isn't climate change the great equalizer? But no, it is the exact opposite. It, it brings to bear the very real facts that uh, none of this is uh, natural, right? This is all person-made. And uh, this book, if you haven't checked it out, I know this name is familiar, Eric Kleinenberg, because of his ode to libraries, Palaces of the People. Uh, but his original work here in Heat Wave really demonstrated the importance of social connectivity 
social cohesion, and really acknowledging the systemic nature of racism in the country and marginalized communities that are just hit way harder by what's going on here. So making sure libraries are part of that network to create equity and some of the responses for adaptation work is a, a really important voice for libraries to step up and have um, during planning. So uh, I'm just going to wrap up here by giving you a couple of, of examples from libraries that are part of the Sustainable Libraries Initiative. This is a network. At this point, it's grown. We've got 72 libraries pursuing uh, certification, working on a, over 140 actions that speak to issues related to climate change mitigation, adaptation work, uh, and a host of other things that help position libraries to be strong for the future. And I'm going to selfishly start with a program in my own system here at the Mid-Hudson Library System called the Library. Library of Local. These are dedicated sites in my system where these libraries have specialized collections of books and materials, seed lending libraries, tool lending libraries, programs that speak to issues related to climate change adaptation, and they're overlaid in locations of municipalities that have made the commitment to do work in this area as well, which is creating an amplified ability to accelerate work um, that's necessary for adaptation in these locations with the library being the catalyst the nexus. We're also seeing awesome programs. I see Scott Kushner's on the line here in the, in the Syracuse area here in New York. In the Northern Onondaga Public Library, adapt, adapt, adapting some of their land to be used for growing food at the library. You can use your library card to, to borrow a plot of land, and they're growing food for community-supported agriculture. Repair cafes, which I know you've spoken about through this series before, perhaps the most perfect example of adaptation programming in libraries these days. And disaster preparedness work is making sure folks are prepped. They understand what to do. They understand who's in the community that's helpful. They understand how they can be helpful if their home is not direly affected by the outcomes of a major heat wave or a flooding or a hurricane hitting them. So great examples coming out of the field of libraries that are celebrating uh, first responders, helping to be part of the conversation to help kids not be fearful, but be prepared for what's going on and really helping communities come together because we can't just come together in the aftermath of events that are being caused and, uh, by climate change. We need to be building that collegiality and sense of neighborhood all the time so that we can build that resiliency in our communities to adapt over time. So I am very conscientious of the time here and that you want to hear from uh, Bill McKibben and not necessarily Rebecca Smith Aldridge. So I just want to give you a lead here. If you want to learn more about the Sustainable Libraries Initiative and you can follow the newsletter, the stories of the libraries and the program. These are early adopters who are putting their money where their mouth is, they're planning where their mouth is, their policy where their mouth is, and doing excellent work that can be modeled and uh, scaled across the globe in libraries. So we welcome you to, in, to join us. Uh, you can sign up for the newsletter letter, follow us on social media. Uh, and if you're interested in getting more involved, you can learn more at sustainablelibrariesinitiative.org. And of course, if you can't tell already, I'm really passionate about this topic. So if you want to connect personally, here's my uh, contact info. And I just want to thank Don again for the opportunity to be part of the event today. Thank you, Rebecca. Excellent. Uh, please put your re-enter your contact in the in the chat if you would, if you're if you're interested in doing that. Excellent points all around, and, and your passion reflects the the situation and the circumstance. So we really need to feel passionate about this uh, this issue. You can stop sharing now, I think. And uh, Beth, you are up. Uh, take it away. Introduce yourself as well, and and we'll. Hello. We'll um, uh, you can all see my screen. Yep. All right. I am. Very uh, honored to be part of this group today and to follow Rebecca, as she mentioned, I have known her for a long time and so excited about all the work. She gave you a really great um, overview of everything that libraries are doing and can do. I'm going to just sort of give you an overview of what the NCLIB group is and a couple other initiatives that have been happening. Um, so again, my name is Beth Filer Williams. I'm at Oregon State University and have been involved in this work for all of my library career in some way, shape or form. Um, but recently, I, in the last, this is my second year, I think, with the NCLIB group. The NCLIB group, acronyms of course, because we're in libraries, Environment, Sustainability, and Library Section of IFLA. So this group I wanna speak about a little bit if you're not aware. It's um, 
kind of guided by the commitment of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Climate Agreement, and just a way really for libraries globally to come together and connect on this critical issue. Uh, there's a, um, a video I could put in the chat. I'm gonna try to multitask while I'm talking. Um, let's see. Uh, I will try to grab that in a little bit, but um, uh, some of the information I wanted to share that I like about this group is that global focus. It's both the geography, the cultures, the perspectives globally that allow us to understand this is for everyone. It is global. Like Rebecca said, it doesn't matter whether you're a privileged, you know, rich part of the world or whether you're um, you, you know, one of somebody that's struggling, it's gonna affect us in some way, but it's gonna affect those that are, um, don't have the same privilege and means that we do, especially like in the United States, but even in the US, you see it everywhere. So I think this is a great group to be a part of, to follow the work that they're doing. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you can do that. Our elections are actually happening right now where you can nominate yourself or someone to be a part of the standing committee if you would like. You can always reach out to me directly if you're interested. The actual Congress, if you wanted to go in person to their conference, which they call the Congress, is going to be in Rotterdam in August. And they do a virtual aspect of that too. So you can join in without having to do the carbon in the air to fly all the way to Rotterdam from wherever you're coming from. Um, and we're doing a satellite conference the day before, and it's going to be speaking of cool buildings. It's going to be in a very interesting building that's a green library that was an old locomotive building that they turned into this very green library in the Netherlands. So that's going to be really awesome. But some of the other work that we do is related to, I'm going to flip to the next slide, is book publications, which are all done in open access. And some of them are things like turning old buildings into a green building for a library. Uh, there's one on going green, sustainable strategies in libraries around the world, and the green library, which was from several years ago, a lot of different um, versions of and projects people have done for green libraries. So check out those books. Then we also have do a lot with the green, what we call the green library website. And that includes both a checklist kind of, well, I should start with the definition of what a green library is. And we've translated it into dozens of languages. So it's a great starting tool to see like, what does this mean, green library? We also have a green library checklist, which is a great easy way to kind of get some ideas on maybe how your library and how other libraries are embracing that idea of sustainability in libraries. And there's also um, other ways that you can find other tools through our toolkit, which is fairly new that's been put together and is always being edited. So if you have ideas, there's ways to reach out for the toolkit. So other ways to just follow what's happening, all for free, all open. You don't have to join and to, to follow. Uh, we have a newsletter that comes out every couple months that has a lot of great stories in it. I'm always impressed by the stories that are happening globally, libraries from every walk of life and all the different information that they're sharing, things that they're doing, how they're educating and working with their community. So it's great to check those stories out. And our webinar series, we just did one on citizen science the other week. We're doing one soon. Let's see, it's called Tools for Evidence-Based Storytelling, Reflective Practices Using the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It's on February 16th. So that's coming up soon. So there's a lot of these kind of opportunities to learn more globally. And I'll put a shout out for the Green Library Awards. It's due February 28th, but we're doing a call now. So if you have a green library, if you're doing a green library project, try for one of our Green Library Awards. Um, let's see, we have uh, definitely different ways to follow. And I can put that in the chat when I'm done from Twitter to Instagram, you know, all the usual places. So that's a little bit about Ensalib, and I'm happy to talk more. I didn't want to take too much more time, but I wanted to give a couple more shout outs to some other ways that you can get involved and find out more information. The Sustainability Roundtable has been around for 10 years. This is celebrating our 10 year anniversary right now, this month from when it started. And there's a lot of great work that's being done. When you think about eco literacy that was mentioned earlier, they do these top 10 sustainable themed children's books, which is a great way to bring vetted sources and books to get 
kids into reading and understand some of these themes. They do citations for wellness. They do webinars as well. They have a Zotero collection of resources. So definitely check out Sustain RT if you haven't already. And I also want to give a shout out to this Resilient Communities grant that happened during the pandemic time, 2020, 2021. There was 25 public and academic library grantees. And I've seen, there was just a presentation at LibLearnX. I saw one online yesterday from Sustain RT that were talking about some of the libraries that have done this kind of work, have gotten this grant and did some of this work to respond to climate change, to build their resiliency. And they're still doing the work today. They got a grant and then they've taken it further. They've continued this work. So it's really amazing to see. And this is really relevant to this talk today is the crew, the communities responding to extreme weather or crew, climatecrew.org. If you haven't checked that out, they do amazing work to establish resilient hubs in libraries and other places around the country. And these grantees were part of it. A great example, I'll point out the Blue Marble Libraries of Massachusetts have taken this and springboarded to so many other things. Um, I'll throw some uh, links in the chat as well for their work because they're a great model beyond all the great work that's happening in New York, of course. And the last thing I do wanna mention, because this is a new thing on my radar, which I'm wondering if other people are doing this kind of work, because I think it's very important to think about things beyond um, how we can move to this incredible, like I picture an iceberg. It's a lot of the analogies they use in these inter, inner development goals that we're seeing on the surface but there's so much going on underneath from systems to other work we need to do in our, on our own in order to move forward, in order to be able to be resilient, to meet these climate crisis challenges, we need to start working on some things ourselves. These inner development goals help with your relations to yourself, to caring about the world, to connecting and collaborating and to drive change, we really need to do this inner work. So I'm very interested in how libraries are doing some of this inner development work. And I have been in um, webinars with people globally. This is a very big global movement. And I don't see a lot of people in the United States doing this, but I see it very globally coming together, very grassroots, very inspiring. So please reach out to me if you're someone interested or doing work in inner development goals. And with that note, uh, thank you for letting me speak for a few minutes and I'll turn it over to um, the next. Thank you so much. Thank you, Beth. Outstanding uh, work that you're doing and, and that uh, Insuleb is doing. So I highly recommend everybody check that out. Uh, your point about uh, global action is just so on point. <clears throat> this is a global event and we're all in this. I mean, we're, whatever corner you're in, it's you're in the same place with everybody on this one, one earth. And so that's always struck us as, as an ideal match for a global network of libraries, people who are, are uh, learning in, in uh, a context which is as flexible as the need demands. And there's nothing with greater need than this. Uh, it, you know, if there's anything that's both local and global, it's just it's this uh, change, this crisis we're in, and and a global network of libraries working on it, sharing ideas and resources is uh, just ideal uh, opportunity for us as we see it. There, there's one uh, point about this response that, that was made uh, two weeks ago in our first adaptation session uh, with uh, Diane Connery, who's on from uh, Pottsboro, Texas Library, is the the library as a as a response command center, a community center, a community hub for a response to a large scale event, because the first responders are not places that that can happen. They're completely overwhelmed, and there's no place to go for any kind of information or help. A library is that's where people will just think of going. You know, whether you advertise it or not, and whether you want to do it or not, people are just going to show up at your door and say, well, "Can you help?" And and so. Uh, that's a uh, that's a role that kind of a like it or not. It's so you know, sorry, but you're you're drafted to to play this response role. So better prepare. And uh, the 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 other point I made before I will we'll turn it over to Bill is this the sustainability notion. We are talking about sustainability. I think today what we're talking about is survivability. You know, yes, we want to sustain it. We have to do all this heavy lifting, long term work, but we also want to survive these events to be able to do sustainable work. And that requires a uh, um, 
uh, you know, a strategy and a plan for that. And so hopefully all the work that Rebecca and Beth and, and other uh, organizations are so far into studying this and creating resources can be of help as we hope we can uh, uh, spread that more widely and draw more people into being being part of that. So enough of that, enough of me, certainly. And uh, so we were going to we're going to turn it over to Bill McKibben. Welcome, Bill. Uh, we're so pleased to have you. And uh, I'm just going to stop my own pin here somewhere. There we go. And uh, Bill is, I think everybody knows, is a leading uh, climate activist and is out there, has been out there for years and years on the front lines, uh, uh, making these points uh, 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 that we're talking about today. And of course, we had the quote that he so kindly provided to us today that that connecting, especially the unconnected, uh, is a is an is an immediate and smart response because those are people in places that are most vulnerable. And it's something that we can do. It's a it's a focus of Gigabit Libraries is connectivity solutions. And so, Bill, welcome, and please uh, please take it away. If uh, anything you'd like to say, and we'll we'll just go where we'll go. Fantastic. Don, a great pleasure to get to join everybody here today. Thank you for asking me. It's always a pleasure for a writer to get to um, talk about libraries. Uh, I've written 20 some books now over the years. And one of the things that I like about the craft of uh, writing is unlike almost every other thing, I know that everyone will be able to read uh, uh, what I produce, whether they have money or not, because there's a library that's keeping those books. And truthfully, it's kind of odd that we decided long ago that the one thing we were going to share as a society was books. Um, I'm glad we did, uh, uh, but it is, it, it's odd that that's mainly where it, that, at least where it began and for a long time where it ended. And I think that this conversation is really powerful because it's understanding that there are ways to build fast on that same model uh, uh, and understand that uh, doing things in common, working together is a place where libraries have a tremendous lead over the rest of the society. My wife helped set up the first library in our remote rural community. Uh, 20 some years ago, and it changed the town in profound ways. Part of those were just access to books, but uh, more it became a, uh, a community center. And as you all know, libraries are community centers, at least good ones, almost every place around the country and around the world. And what that means is clearly going to be changing and deepening as this century goes on. I wrote the first book about climate change back in 1989. We knew most then what we needed to know. Um, and sadly, though lots of other people started writing books and things, it was not enough to convince our leaders to change the way that we operated. The power of the fossil fuel industry was so strong that we've kept pouring carbon into the atmosphere. And as a result, we're now at a place where the planet's temperature is quickly rising, and with it, a tide of, of disasters of one kind or another, uh, fire and flood and, and uh, drought and uh, on and on and on. And in those emergencies, uh, it's going to be utterly important to be able to help coordinate that kind of uh, resilient response. Um, if I could recommend one book for everybody here, it might be my friend and colleagues, uh, Rebecca Solnit's book, Paradise Built in Hell, uh, about the way that communities react in the early days of uh, traumatic events. And the book is highly optimistic in that people generally figure out how to organize themselves uh, to take act the action that's needed, even or usually, especially when there's a kind of vacuum because governments are not yet fully engaged in in response and that's very good news the problem with climate change is that um, 
to use the language of uh, uh, of one insurance company report a couple of years ago, uh, the return time between repeat events will get uh, shorter and shorter and shorter. <laughs> um, you know, it's one thing to respond once. Here in Vermont, we had a, a tremendous series of floods 10 years ago that when we had the largest rainstorm in our history, the kind of rainstorm you can only get in a globally warmed world where warm air holds more water vapor. And people responded tremendously well for weeks and weeks and weeks and digging out their mud out of their neighbor's basements, reopening roads, so on and so forth. But if that becomes a regular occurrence and in parts of the world becoming regular occurrences, uh, then it's going to take a, a, a somewhat more organized um, and, and routinized way of responding. And libraries, because they're often the, the obvious hub in any community, and because they have this old ingrained legacy of sharing things, um, becomes, uh, be, become an obvious place in a community to coordinate uh, some of that effort, that relief, that reconstruction, at whatever it is. So that I think is a, a big part of this to bear in mind. And then of course, libraries are also places increasingly that serve as the kind of connection hubs for uh, information, including digital information uh, out and around the world. Um, so the ability to connect like that becomes ever more important in crisis situations. Libraries are also highly trusted institutions, um, which is important in a world where many of our other institutions are far less trusted than they used to be. Uh, you don't want to look at the polling about what people think, say, of political institutions at the moment. And um, for many communities, uh, uh, law enforcement has become um, less trusted than it used to be for reasons that we can understand when we look at, say, the pictures coming out of Memphis last week. Um, and so uh, many of, in many cases, that leaves a, a, a small number of institutions, perhaps local schools, certainly local libraries, as places that people continue to put trust in uh, and, and understand as a kind of refuge in a storm whether that storm is personal because people have become homeless, say, or whether it's community because there's been some kind of natural disaster or another. So I'm very, very glad that this is on people's minds going forward. I think that the period we're entering into is gonna be a very interesting one. Some of it's going to be very difficult and traumatic because the pace of disasters is clearly increasing quite dramatically. But some of it's going to be very interesting too, and I think strengthening of local communities in ways that will, libraries can help take advantage of and help coordinate. We're clearly moving from a model where we power our world on energy that comes from distant places, Saudi Arabia, Texas, uh, to a world where we power our lives on energy that comes from close to home, sun and wind, uh, because it's now cheaper and cleaner than fossil energy. And that should, over the long run, work in the direction of strengthening local communities, uh, because one of our most important commodities will increasingly be close to home. And I think that's very, very useful. You know, in the largest sense, and I've written books about this over the years that you may find in your library, and maybe the most pertinent is one called Deep Economy. Um, we've spent the last hundred years downplaying and degrading the importance of local communities uh, uh, over and over and over again. In the last 50 or 75 years, neighbors have been essentially optional in this in sort of advanced consumer societies. You don't really need them for anything. If you have a credit card, you can get whatever you need in this world delivered to your front door. You not, never have to meet anyone again if you didn't have to. And we've fallen out of the, you know, uh, neighborliness is a, uh, 
skill like any other, and it atrophies um, fairly quickly sometimes. And you can tell by looking at the statistics, the average American has about half as many friends uh, as the close friends as the average American of the 1950s, because we've built communities where we live further apart. Uh, and because we have all, we don't, because we don't really have physical need of our neighbors for, for much. But that changes when life gets tougher. I was a little late getting on here because we're having a, 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 a beautiful sharp cold outbreak across the Northeast today. And I was making sure that the older neighbors had firewood in um, for the day and things like that, because it's too cold for them to safely be out. Um, we're going to need that neighborliness uh, uh, returning in a big way. And libraries are really are one of the very few institutions that have made a practice of that, uh, uh, never let it drop over those decades. So there's both physical utilitarian reasons and kind of philosophical reasons why libraries could turn out to be extremely important in this next difficult phase of the human story. And um, um, uh, uh, I, you know, I, I hesitate to, I mean, what, it, it's not 100% clear that we're going to do what we need to do to even make it possible to survive as civilizations. We need to act more quickly than we're acting at the moment. But in the best of cases, it's going to be a harder time um, than we've come through in most of our lives. And the upshot of that will mean relying on those around us in ways that perhaps we haven't had to before. And I think in the end, that will be a good thing because humans are socially evolved primates. We weren't built to be as isolated as we are at the moment. And that's one reason that Americans' satisfaction with their lives has dropped sharply over the last five decades, even as we've become much richer. Um, uh, I'll leave you with a statistic from the from a slightly different um, uh, sphere to kind of demonstrate what I mean. Um, you know, farmers markets sprung up around much of the country in recent years, and in some sense, they're a kind of you could think of them as sort of analogous to libraries in certain ways. Um, and the most important of them is a place where people. Uh, uh, find a um, hub for connecting. You all have been visited the supermarkets. You know how that works. You walk in, you visit the stations of the cross around the perimeter of the market. You take your uh, stuff to the cashier, if there even is a cashier anymore. And perhaps you have a discussion about cash or credit, you know. Um, when people went to the farmer's market, sociologists following them around found out that they were having 10 times more conversations per visit uh, than people in the supermarket. Not 10% more, 10 times more. Um, um, and that's why it turns out people liked them. Yes, they liked the fresh, healthy food, but really what they liked was the sense of connection with others. And so as we design and think about the programs that we're putting forward and things, it's extremely useful uh, to uh, uh, remember that and remember what a remarkable asset uh, a library can be. I think there's been a sense for a while that libraries were kind of old fashioned. Um, and I think that the upshot of what I'm saying is that libraries are very new fashioned now uh, in really important ways. And this is prime among them. So I'm going to stop there and just say many, many thanks for letting me participate in a fascinating discussion. Well, thank you very much, Bill. Uh, you make great points, of course, uh, about the circumstance and, and the value and the potential for libraries to play an increasingly important role in, uh, in response and sustainability and survivability, if I may. Uh, the... <laughs> 
there's so many branches of what libraries are and do in communities. We've started referring to them as the Swiss Army knife of public institutions. It's hard to kind of pin them down almost. We go to books, of course, and that's that's good, but it's just so much more than that. And the, and the pressure on libraries to change from the technology pressures that we're all under is is immense. And uh, uh, one of the things that we've seen is the, is the library not only is the potential to play this role as a community command center, which a number of communities have set these up. Lafayette, Louisiana, created a whole new library just to be a control and command center for, for disaster response once they were hit by the refugees from Katrina, a remarkable uh, building. And, and we were talking about uh, uh, the little library in Pottsboro, Texas that did that when the big deep freeze. They just they loaded up and became a place where so many of these things uh, came together because the first responders are just completely overwhelmed in these circumstances. So the that's one new thing for libraries. Another is the library as a as a demonstration site for all these technologies. Uh, you know, a place you can go and put your hands on on uh, uh, heating technologies and solar technologies, and and you can learn about them. So it's an ideal lab and demo for these various uh, approaches and technologies as well. So. Um, I've asked if anybody has questions for Bill. Uh, Bill, I, I think you're, uh, you've been talking about, and you touched on the insurance question uh, and, and the wider economic pressures, I think, that either support or resist these kinds of changes that have to happen. Uh, one of those is, uh, of course, the damages, which are just increasing. We've shown charts of, of the billion dollar rates of billion dollar disaster increases, which is just skyrocketing uh, every every year, at least the trend is going up. Uh, and, and so this obviously has the attention of the insurers and the reinsurers who are paying attention to it. What what are they doing about that? I mean, are they just raising the, the premiums or, or are they trying to uh, mitigate or, or change the, the structure? The insurance industry is one of the oddest parts of this whole story. Um, because they they both are helping and hurting in huge ways. Um, the biggest insurance companies, the big European reinsurance companies, Munich Re, Swiss Re, so on, have recognized for a long time the dangers of climate change, and they've put out superb data. They have lots of data on it. Um, and the smartest of them have begun to realize that, <laughs> that among other things, uh, climate change uh, is potentially fatal just to the idea of insurance itself. If you think of um, how insurance works, it relies on one of the most remarkable of human inventions and one of the most powerful, the actuarial table, uh, uh, a brilliant insight of humans that you could more or less predict the future with some certainty based on what had happened in the past when people were going to die, how many things were going to burn down, you know, on and on and on. That underpins insurance, which in turn underpins our economy. If you can't hedge risk effectively, then no one will ever do anything, build a house, you know, start a business, whatever it is. The only problem with the actuarial table is it's exquisitely dependent on the world behaving in the future as it has in the past. And if you dramatically change the ground rules, i.e. you increase the temperature dramatically, then that incredibly powerful tool becomes much less powerful. And you have to start doing things like increasing premiums a lot because you can't no longer predict you know, what's going to happen and things. Um, so on the one hand, the insurance industry has been thinking about this and working on it or you know, to some degree. On the other hand, like so much of the rest of our capitalist enterprise, they seem unable to slow themselves down from doing dumb things at the same time. They continue to invest huge amounts of money in the fossil fuel industry. I mean, an insurance industry is basically just collecting your money and investing it somewhere else um, and profiting on the return. Um, and so we've been trying to stop them from doing that just as we're working to stop banks and things from doing that. But the insurance industry goes one step further. Uh, they continue to provide the underwriting services necessary for the fossil fuel industry to continue the expansion that scientists have told us they must stop. 
So you can't build a new pipeline or something unless you can get insurance for it. You can't even go survey it until you've you know, insured the surveyors. There's only six or seven companies in the world that are competent to do this kind of work, but in return for the relatively small profit from it, they continue to do it. And uh, you know, someone wrote that this was the sort of um, perfect example of that old Leninist dictum about capitalists selling you the rope which you will use to hang them. You know, it's it's as short sighted and backwards as it's possible to be. There's a lot of good activism going on around it, uh, uh, and it's beginning to have mild effect. A few insurance companies, especially in Europe, have begun to say we won't do this kind of work anymore or invest in these things. But there's a lot of pressure on the big companies in this country, like Liberty Mutual, say, uh, to do the right thing. Um, and it's, you know, it's interesting that so much of that wonderful work at things like Crew that people were talking about actually coming out of the Boston area where Liberty Mutual is headquartered. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it pains one to see institutions working at such cross purposes all the time. Yeah, uh, it, well, you, you touch on the political aspect here, the, sort of the macro level uh, for these industries. And uh, so there's been a, a, I mean, we could just go with that if, for a moment, if you're willing. It's a, there's been a debate about uh, what's the effective form of decision making at the, at the national governmental level. So there's this messy democratic system where you have all these short-term kinds of uh, motivations of, of quarterly profits and re-election. And you have this authoritarian model where you can just make command, central command decisions and do things. Uh, and so these have, you know, the, we're in this kind of struggle right now. So it's a, I think it's a question that people have is what's the preferred system to deal with this if we're stuck in our democratic capitalism with short-term thinking and we need to think longer term and the authoritarian model seems to be capable of that but are they really doing that i mean where where do you come down on kind of political reform or critical uh, approach i think we need speaking for myself i think we need more democracy not less um, the changes that we're going to have to make are big and they're going to require buy-in from lots of people and that requires democracy. The problem is that we've allowed lazily our democracy to be kind of overwhelmed by money um, and we need to be able to increasingly get it back. Now there's some good signs. The U.S. Congress by the narrowest of margins last year managed to finally pass a climate bill 34 years after Jim Hansen had first testified to Congress about what we then called the greenhouse effect. Uh, this is the Inflation Reduction Act, which comes with lots of money for local communities and institutions like libraries to help make this quick transition to renewable energy. So that was a real triumph of people organizing and pushing. But of course, the fossil fuel industry pushes back at all times, and their tool is not people, it's cash and our system is altogether too susceptible to that. So, you know, I mean, what can I tell you? I'm a, I'm a Vermonter, um, uh, I'm with Bernie. I think that Citizens United was a bad idea and uh, I think it gives way too much power uh, to corporations. And I don't really think corporations are people or should be thought of as people um, because, you know, uh, they're very powerful and useful in certain ways and and not in others i you know i wrote a book years ago in part about a local friend of mine here who's a beekeeper uh and a wonderful one and i so i spent a lot of time with bees and corporations always strike me in a sense as like a beehive i mean if you want the, if you want someone to go uh uh get uh, some task done, build some interesting thing or, or you know, whatever, um, then a corporation is a very useful construct for making that happen. But you, if, you, if you wanted to have a discussion with bees about whether or not 
going and collecting nectar and making more honey was a good idea or not, it wouldn't be a useful discussion. That's just what bees do. They don't think about it. They don't, they can't modulate their behavior. That's what they do. Corporations the same way. They, they're good at doing their thing, which is making money, but they can't um, ever understand why that might not be the only thing that's important in a society. So giving them the political power that we have turns out to have been a conceptual mistake, I think. And, and it's time for us to have democracies that really work. You know, I spend most of my time now organizing this thing called Third Act, uh, which is progressive organizing for people over the age of 60. You can tell your grandparents about it. And, um, and we, um, we have two issues, the climate, climate and the political climate, because we think they're deeply linked. If we can't preserve a working democracy, then we probably can't preserve a working climate either. And so those are the, that's how we see and understand the world. Very good. Uh, in fact, uh, corporations, uh, I take your point about being people, corporations are in fact fictions that have been permitted by government. They're artificial creations by government, which is our collective uh, decision making. So I think maybe it went a little far to uh, give them personhood. Uh, let's bring it back to the neighborhood level here as we talk about where libraries actually live and, and your point about the sort of dissolution of neighborliness uh, very much resonates with uh, the work from Robert Putnam, uh, Bowling Alone. So the kind of the disappearance of these community organizations, institutions, which have bound us together have just slowly dissolved for, you know, we can pin it on technology, of course, uh, but you know, well, yeah, let's just do that. Uh, because it's it it propels us, it, it shapes us. We build it, and it recreates us into the the society that we are. Um, but but libraries, uh, to to remake your point, are anchor institutions and in communities. They, if if not the heart of a community, representing the the caring for people. The library model is open to all. I mean, who says that? That doesn't want your wallet or your soul. And their only motivation is to help people. I mean, it's just really amazing. They're, they're just wonderful. And, and therefore, I would agree with you that they're ideally suited to be the, the, the local heart of this response to this global dilemma that we're in. People are just have to turn somewhere. We had an outage here in I'm, you know, Marin County, north of, of, of San Francisco. They, the, the utility turned off the power because they were feeding the uh, fires up in the north. Just without notice, we, you know, uh, a county of a quarter of a million people were just out of, out of power, we go, you know, for like five to seven days. It changes your perspective. And that was, the, that was the point I think you were making about when you feel something like the cold that is outside your door right now, you and Dan York from the Internet Society, your neighbor up there in Vermont, uh, it gets it gets real. It gets your attention about you know why, and and it seems like these effects can pull us backward to cause and maybe get us to do something, uh, take actions uh, about causes while we're dealing with the effects. So, um, what what can you what can you leave us with that uh, that we can take away? We're coming up on the hour. We start a little bit late. Uh, so we might run over a few minutes and be okay for an hour anyway, but uh, give us I, a final no, thought. No, this is the perfect place to end. And I do have to jump off. I have to go do a, an interview. But the, um, the <laughs> I remember the day that, I can remember the day that I got my library card when I was seven or eight. And I remember it as the first time that I felt like I belonged to something outside my home, outside my household in a way. Uh, and I remember thinking of it as a, you know, a great gift, but also a kind of responsibility that I was part of this larger thing now. Um, uh, the library, the, the library, as I said at the beginning, is a strange institution for Americans anyway in that it upholds the idea of sharing things in a very privatized society. 
uh, society that otherwise has decided that we each need to own each <laughs> of our own things. There's a, something quite subversive about that, uh, which probably is you know one reason that 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 uh, certain politicians and things are always trying to cut the money for libraries and cut the money for anything public, public radio, public TV, whatever it is. Um, but libraries in community after community after community are not only a place where we share things, they're also beloved. And they're very hard to take down because people cherish them. And uh, that, that the fact that they've survived uh, is, is somewhat anomalous. And the fact that they're now here when we need them in a different way, going into this newer and tougher world where we're going to neighbors will no longer be optional. Um, well, that's a very lucky stroke on our for all of us and and we'll need to build on it. And I'm afraid I do need to get off, but I'm really grateful for all the work that everybody's doing here and grateful again, just as I said at the beginning, as a writer for the fact that I know that uh, though I have to sell a certain number of books to pay the rent, um, that everything I write is available to everybody in the country to read because it's in a library. And that's a, a, it's always the thing that I've liked about my profession. It, it, it may cost me money, but it more than makes up for it uh, in lots and lots of other ways. So thank you all immensely. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, you make the practical point about libraries once again. They are naturally practical uh, responses to our various needs as a, as a society and community. So um, we'll hope you'll carry the, that uh, message around. Uh, we'll do. Particularly, particularly with the technology community, which I think needs to hear that more than politicians will hear what they'll hear, uh, rich people will hear what they But technology people really need to understand this, and they, they just tend to take libraries as for granted and we will they still it. <laughs> okay real good thank you all right so uh we we're over a couple of minutes but uh i think we can do just sort of open mic here anybody wants to weigh in on anything uh before we close out the session you're welcome to uh you can raise your hand or dan you're you're looking like you want to say something uh, no, I actually have to leave also, Don. So, okay. All right. Thanks well, a lot. Thanks again, Dan, for the support and uh, stay warm up there. All right. Bye. Rebecca, thank you. Everybody, thank you. We'll have this uh, recording up in a few days. Thanks for all your comments and your appreciation. He was, Bill was, was great. And I have to say, Beth, you and Rebecca really held forth. I'm, I'm inspired myself. And I, I spent a lot of time looking at this stuff too. So can, can individuals join Insulib? Oh, I think maybe we lost Beth. Oh, I'm still here. Um, oh. Yes, but you have to be a part of IFLA. Um, but uh, sometimes you're, um, institutions can be a part part so like my for me Oregon State is a member they pay to be a member of IFLA so then I can be a member of um you don't have quite the same amount of uh what do I want to say you can't always necessarily vote or there's certain things that might be restrictive but find out if your institution or maybe advocate that your institution becomes a member and then you get a lot more access and um, I think it's a great way to go Stephen uh what what are the membership uh limits on if you're still there on ifla membership can an individual library join yes there's a there's a load of options so you can join as an individual affiliate it comes to about 70 euros i think maybe a little bit less and um, there's a whole range of options for institutions there, there is an ncilib mailing list i'm just going to stick the link in the chat that's an open one for subscribers although exactly as beth said if you want to actually be sort of involved in the core group and in steering its work then get involved and know get yourself nominated join the committee very good very good if anyone's so, interested reach out to me you have to get nominated to be elected on a committee so you need someone that's currently there to nominate you so um if you're interested talk to me 
I think you already put your link in the chat, uh, Beth. Or maybe you can I again. I did uh, the link earlier. I can drop my email in there as well if that helps. Okay. Well, where uh, people are moving on to other things as they do at the uh, hour. And uh, so this has been great. I, I think this, uh, sorry for any confusion anybody may have had about the link, uh, but uh, everything seemed to work in the end, which is what I hope for all of us <laughs> as we need it to, because there's just not really any alternatives. So we'll revisit this. This is not the last that uh, we've, had to uh, say about this or, or have more voices come in and, and expand on this topic. I think we've, I think we've hit right into a, a really valuable point of, of convergence between global and local and uh, responses first and second and however you want to uh, call it. This is a, this is a place that is, uh, when I say place, what I mean is the library world is a place to have these discussions, to lead policy uh, forums in, in communities at the state and national level, at the global level. And uh, it's, it's a coherent profession that can understand itself. I've, I've been in all different kinds of environments. And the only one I've been in where people could sit down from any, any institution and have a, a, a meaningful conversation are network managers and librarians <laughs> they they speak a common language and they can uh, even if they have their institutions and enterprises are completely different they have commonality that they can uh, uh, create uh, meaningful conversations just immediately and so they're special in that regard it's unlike schools for example that wouldn't be even thinkable with uh, the range of schools and and all the various uh, political pressures on schools or I don't know, maybe health officials, but maybe not. But librarians are, are the best. So thank you all for being here again. And we'll be back. I meant to mention in the beginning, we're we're shifting our, our meeting day to Thursdays next week. And we're going to have the head of the iSchool at the University of Texas, uh, David Lankus, lead a discussion on uh, developments in AI, which is uh, kind of on everybody's mind. What does that mean? to libraries. Uh, Boom or Doom, I think, is the uh, title of uh, next Thursday's session. We'll have that out at the first of the week. So thanks again, Beth and Rebecca, especially uh, for making the time and, and presenting just excellent, useful, helpful information. So we'll, we'll be in touch. So with that, I think we'll just close out.